Randy Meisner and Bernie Ledden were two of the four founding members of the Eagles. Both were instrumental in the early success at getting the Eagles flying to a height none of them could have imagined at that time. Both ended up quitting and walking off and out of their contract. Were they forced out? Well, it's a fact that Glenn Fry and Bernie Ledden did not see eye to eye when it came to the music and songwriting as the band progressed. And it's a fact stated by Glenn, he was tired of Randy's whining and complaining. I wonder, as I'm sure many do, then why didn't Glenn just fire him? I don't know. Maybe Glenn looked into the future and saw the upcoming battle he would have with Don Felder who, although he wasn't a founding member and was hired a bit later, his name does appear on the same contract that Randy and Bernie signed. And after a lengthy court battle, Don seems to be in good financial shape after it. Randy and Bernie's lives went on after leaving the Eagles. Although the Eagles soared to the top of all live performing bands, Randy and Bernie kept a lower profile, playing in different groups and recording sessions. But as we look back on these two guys, keep in mind that if it wasn't for them, I highly doubt the Eagles would have gotten off the ground way back when. Now let's take a look back on Bernie Ledden and then Randy. During his time with the Eagles, Bernie Ledden contributed to the band by shaping their early sound with his great ear for harmony and his heavy influence of country, bluegrass, and folk music style. He was a multi-talented instrumentalist who could play just about anything with strings. Without a doubt, he was a huge contributing factor to the sound that would help get the band signed to a record deal and start them out on the road to success. But the Eagles shifted gears and started to veer off that road after a few albums. And what usually ends up as a disaster for most bands only took them faster and farther. But sadly, it left Bernie behind. But it was more than just the music that caused him to leave. A lot more. So let's get right into it and see if we can shed a little light on it, especially from Bernie's side of the road. Bernie Ledden was born in 1947 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His father was an aerospace engineer and the family moved around the United States a lot. They ended up in California when Bernie was a teen and it was there he met many musicians and started honing his talents on anything with strings and really getting into the acoustic style of music. The family then moved to Gainesville, Florida where Bernie was to meet Don Felder and they would strike up a solid friendship. Both boys playing guitar with Don, a more rock and blues player, and Bernie a bluegrass and country style player. The boys got along well and even though the differences in music style, Bernie joined up with the group Don was in called the Monday Quintet. But the music scene in Florida was nothing like California and it wasn't long till Bernie packed up his car, tried to talk Don into going with him, but ended up heading west alone and back to California in 1967. After arriving, he joined a country folk group called Hearts and Flowers. The group didn't last long, and after recording one album, they broke up in 1968. Bernie then joined the group Dillard and Clark, and after recording an album with them, he quit in 1969 to join the Flying Burrito Brothers with his friend Chris Hillman and Graham Parsons. Hillman and Parsons were writing some good songs and the country rock scene was starting to take shape on the West Coast. After recording a few albums, Bernie was to again quit the group and move on. A quick note here about the Flying Burrito Brothers. Graham Parsons who was an integral piece to the band, was to really start the party scene when the band did some opening shows with the Rolling Stones. And Keith Richards decided Graham was a fun companion to party with. A few have said this was the start of his downfall that would eventually lead to Graham's death of an overdose of tequila and morphine in 1973. Bernie, who was now playing with the Flying Burrito Brothers, 
and had played a short time with Linda Ronstadt a little before that, while Linda was starting out and looking for a record deal. Now she had producer John Boylan helping her look. In 1971, she needed to put a band together, so her and Boylan went to work. After getting Don Henley to play drums, her next choice was Bernie to play lead guitar. But since he was with the Burrito, she decided to ask Glenn Fry, who was friends and writing partner with J.D. Souther, who Linda was living with at the time. Glenn needed the work, so he accepted to play guitar. But Linda still wanted Bernie. And John Boylan went to him and asked Bernie, and he accepted. Randy Meisner was also to join them. Linda said when the band would practice over at her and J.D.'s place, you could tell there was something there. She said the voices blended well together. Don had told Linda that they were going to try and keep this band going after the tour, and Linda, who was looking for a recording contract, totally understood. Bernie seemed to be real happy with the band. He had an equal say in the group and was writing and playing the style of music he loved. But that all started to change after the Desperado album. The first two albums were produced by Glenn Johns and recorded in London. Both albums made good use of Bernie's talent on guitar, banjo, mandolin, steel guitar, dobro. The group basically split up the lead vocals among the four of them on the first album. The second album, Desperado, did not fare as well on the charts, and for the third album, the band decided to move a little more away from the country rock feel and more to the rock and roll side. Glenn Johns only produced two songs for that album, one being Best of My Love, their first number one, and then they brought in Bill Simzik and started recording back in California. Things were really starting to change in the band around this time. Don Felder was brought in to give the band a true rock guitarist. Don and Glenn, along with J.D. Souther and Jackson Brown, were writing more songs which didn't leave much room on an album for Bernie or Randy's songs and the band was starting to really party their brains out. Bernie was becoming more unhappy with the way things were going. You can't blame him. His roots were in folk, bluegrass, and country music. He was a good guitarist, but his strength was in those styles, not the rock directions the Eagles were heading. And I'm sure he could see the writing on the wall. And Bernie wasn't one to hide his feelings too well. He was very headstrong. When the Eagles were formed, it was supposed to be four members, with all four having a say-so in the group and its music. By this time, that was about over, and Glenn and Don Henley were taking over the band and its direction. Bernie says, they were pretty pushy, honestly, but producer Glenn Johns kind of created the balance that exists on the first two albums, when after he left, the whole dynamic changed, and then pretty soon, Don and Glenn had written all the hits, so it did become the Don and Glenn Show. With the change in producers and music, the well-documented arguments between the band and a factor not many talked about, but Bernie had been changing a little over the years. It was time for Bernie to dump the can of Budweiser over Glenn and leave. Bernie's change I'm talking about as he started to live a cleaner lifestyle. He was getting away from the harder drugs and had cut way back on his drinking and took on a healthy eating and just a cleaner, healthy lifestyle altogether. And this could not work with a band who worked and partied as long and as hard as the Eagles did. I do think had Bernie really wanted to, he could have been a solid part of the band musically into the following years. But in my opinion, I think he was just tired of it all and done. He could have fit in musically had he wanted, but I do not think he could change who he had grown into. Now this is my opinion only. If you have one, please feel free to share it in the comments section. One of Bernie's final songs with the Eagles was, I Wish You Peace, written by him and his girlfriend Patty Davis, was really a good song. It's on one of these Nights album, and it's worth checking out, a well-written song. Don Felder said in his book, Bernie took off and went to Hawaii. But he came back after a bit and tried his hand at an album in 1977 with the Bernie Ledden and Michael Georgiatis band and released the album, National Progressions. Bernie got Glenn Johns to produce it and he did a good job. But 
Same as I said in my Don Felder video about Don's solo album, I'll say the same about Bernie's. The vocals are buried. The songs on the album are well written and the music is good and all in all it was a good album to listen to. But as far as making it to the charts, well it just didn't do well. As good of a producer as Glenn Johns was, he can only do so much. Give it a listen and let me know what you think about it. Bernie moved on and in the 80s he was back with his old friend Chris Hillman for a pair of releases. 1982's Morning Sky and 1984's Desert Rose and former Christian bluegrass group Ever Call Ready who issued a lone self-titled release in 1985. Two years later, Bernie replaced John McEwen in the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band appearing on the recordings of Hold On in 1987, Working Band in 1988, and Will the Circle Be Unbroken Volume 2 in 89. In the 1990s, Bernie and Russell Smith from the Amazing Rhythm Aces launched the novelty act Run c and which specialized in doing country versions of rap songs, and issued two releases, 1993, Into the Twangy First Century, and in 1995, Roe vs. Wade. Right after that, Bernie was elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with the other members of the Eagles in 1998. One person Bernie thanked was John Boylan, Linda Ronstadt's manager, for asking him into the original group. Then, in 2003, Bernie released a solo CD, Mirror. Now this album I thought was fantastic. One of the best songs I think from the album is What Do I Own? Give it a listen and check it out, the whole album. I think this is the best work Bernie ever did after leaving the Eagles. Now here's a spark from this album. There is a producer player on it named Ethan Johns, who just so happens to be the son of producer Glenn Johns. Remember him from the earlier in the video? A lot of good players and singers on Mirror, including Emmy Lou Harris. I just can't say enough about it. I wasn't too fond of the first one Bernie did back in 77, but this one he hit a home run on, in my opinion. Bernie moved from California to Nashville around 1990, and he now lives on a 300-acre farm. He spends a lot of time working on sessions besides his own projects. As far as his time in the Eagles, Bernie says, I don't regret any of it. It was a great time in my life, but everything since then has been great too. What's funny is that a year after I left, they did wind up taking a long break. Earlier in the video, I had mentioned it was more than just the music causing the problems, but you can see the grinding schedule was also wearing on Bernie. Eagles books often say that Bernie was unhappy that the band was moving away from their country rock sound, and that could be true, but he disputes this notion. Here's what he had to say. That's an oversimplification, he said. It implies that I had no interest in rock and blues or anything but country rock. That's just not the case. I didn't just play Fender Telecaster, I played a Gibson Les Paul, and I enjoyed rock and roll. That's evident from the earlier albums. If Bernie regretted one thing, it was pouring the beer over Glenn, which he got in touch with Glenn years later and apologized for. And Glenn accepted. In 2013, he was asked to join back up with the Eagles and do the History of the Eagles tour. After doing that a few years, he was asked if he'd ever play with them again, and this is what he had to say. We'll never say never, right? Interestingly, when the two and a half years of touring was over, the last show, Glenn Fry gave me a big hug and said, it's not over. And I went, okay, cool man, let's talk about it. Glenn's not here, so that can't happen. Honestly, I don't really see it happening unless it maybe it's just a one-off or a special occasion kind of thing. I don't think it will, but never say never. I'm good friends with all the guys. Last I heard, Bernie was living out on his farm just outside of Nashville and was happy. He said he still writes songs and might even do another album someday. Bernie's 75 years old now and seems to be taking life easy. 
There's no doubt that Bernie was a musical force out on the West Coast back in the days of the country rock scene. I'm not saying he's underrated, but he flies under the radar a lot. That Eagles Greatest Hits album, 71 through 75, is the best-selling Eagles album of all time. A big part of that album's success is Bernie Ledden. I'll just leave it at that. Randy Meisner was probably best known as the bass player for the Eagles from 1971 to 1977. But he was more than just the bass player. He wrote and co-wrote on many of their first songs. He was the lead vocalist on their first million selling hit, Take It to the Limit. Randy was also a harmony singer with an incredibly high and pitch perfect voice. As with anyone who was a member of the Eagles, there was problems and altercations, and Randy was no exception. But his story started long before the Eagles and runs way past his time with them. We'll take a short look back on his early life and then try and find out how he is doing later on after some physical and mental health issues and the gun incident which took the life of his wife. So let's start from the beginning. He was born Randall Herman Meisner, March 8, 1946, in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Scotts Bluff is northeast of Cheyenne, Wyoming, right on the state lines. He grew up on the family farm. He recalled that his mother was always singing around the house. His grandfather, George, was a violin teacher. Randy took an interest in the guitar at 10 years old after watching Elvis on The Ed Sullivan Show. Randy started taking guitar lessons and playing in local bands. While in high school, one of his teachers suggested he try playing the bass guitar. Randy really got off on the bass guitar sounds he heard on the Motown and R&B records, and it really inspired him to take up the instrument. Randy said playing the bass came real natural to him, and that really shows in his playing. He played bass and sang with the local band named The Dynamics, and later called the Driving Dynamics from 1961 to 1965. The Driving Dynamics released their first record, a four-song EP, with Randy singing lead vocals on Sam Cooke's You Send Me. It was pressed locally and with only 500 copies released. In August 1965, the band signed a record deal with Sully Records out of Amarillo, Texas. They recorded three songs, with Randy singing lead on two of the songs, One of These Days and So Fine. So Fine was released as a single and sold well regionally and in the southeastern United States. After this, Randy moved out to California with a band called The Soul Survivors, later on changing their name to The Poor, because that is what they became. Randy says, I never had a car, I had to walk. I sold the Los Angeles Free Press on Sunset and Highland. I made about five bucks a day. The poor was managed by Charlie Green and Brian Stone, who also managed Buffalo Springfield and Sonny and Cher. The band released several singles on Loma, York, and Decca Records in 1966 and 1967, but they didn't do all that well. In May 1968, after auditioning alongside Greg Allman and Timothy B. Schmidt, Meisner joined Poco with former Buffalo Springfield members Richie Ferre and Jim Messina. Meisner appeared on the group's first album, Picking Up the Pieces, but quit the band shortly before the record was released. His exit was a result of his anger at being excluded from participation in the final mix playback sessions for the album. Only Messina and Fure were to complete production. His image was removed from the paintings on the album cover and replaced with a dog. His bass parts and backing vocals were left in the final mix, but his lead vocals were removed and new versions were sung by George Grantham. In April 1969, Meisner joined Ricky Nelson's Stone Canyon Band and persuaded Nelson and producer John Boylan to hire his former bandmates from the poor Alan Kemp, Pat Shanahan, and pedal steel guitarist Tom Brumley. 
previously a Buckaroo backing up Buck Owens' band. Mandy also continued to support himself as a session performer, playing bass on two tracks of James Taylor's Sweet Baby James album, the songs Country Road and Blossom, recorded in December 1969. That same month, he played bass on several tracks for Waylon Jennings' 1970 album, Singer of Sad Songs, recorded in RCA Victor Studio in Hollywood. In mid-1971, he joined up with some other musicians to become Linda Ronstadt's backing band along with Don Henley, Glenn Fry, and Bernie Ledden. By mid-September of that year, the Eagles were formed. They decided they wanted to try it on their own and left Ronstadt and signed with David Geffen's new label, Asylum Record, and cut their debut album in 1972. Randy played the bass and handled lead and backing vocals for the Eagles. He wrote, co-wrote, and sang lead on each of the group's first five albums, most notably Take It to the Limit, the band's first million-selling single. Other songs he wrote and sang lead on included Try and Love Again, Is It True, Take the Devil, Tryin', and he also wrote the song Certain Kind of Fool with Fry and Henley, which also had him singing lead. According to Don Felder, Randy's time in the band was weighed down by his desire to be with his family, as well as the constant bickering between the members. During the 1976-77 tour, in support of the Hotel California album, Randy was bothered by ill health and exhaustion, as the band toured constantly for over 11 months. He also preferred not to be the center of attention, and said, I was always kind of shy. They wanted me to stand in the middle of the stage to sing Take It to the Limit, but I like to be out of the spotlight. The band was starting to feel the strain in a long tour, and Meisner was unhappy. His stomach ulcers had flared up, and his marriage was also gradually heading south. He had been arguing with Glenn Fry about his signature song, Take It to the Limit, during the tour, as he was struggling to hit them high notes in the song. At their show in Knoxville, Tennessee, Meisner decided to skip the song as an encore as he had stayed up late and caught the flu. And Fry and Meisner then became involved in an angry physical confrontation backstage. Randy, who usually stayed out of the confrontations if he could, finally broke. Glenn told Randy to quit being a pussy. Randy grabbed him and started choking the shit out of him until others stepped in and broke it up. After the altercation, Randy said, that was the end. I really felt like I was a member of the group, not a part of it. Sounds kind of like what happened to Bernie Ledden earlier and Don Felder later on. Meisner decided to leave the group after the final date of the tour and return to Nebraska to be with his family. Don Felder and Joe Walsh talked with him a few nights trying to get him to reconsider, but his mind was made up. His last performance was in East Troy, Wisconsin on September 3, 1977. After that, he officially resigned from the band, and like Bernie Ludden before him, he walked away, giving up his share in the Eagles Limited. After the Eagles, Randy released a couple of solo albums. He also toured some with his band, Randy Meisner and the Silverados. He had a couple of top 20 singles, Hearts on Fire and Never Been in Love. In 1989 and 90, Randy reunited with Poco for the Legacy album and tour. Call It Love was the top 20 single in the U.S. Randy sang lead on the song written by Richard Marks, Nothing to Hide, which did well for the band. In 1994, Randy contacted Eagles manager Irving Azoff when he heard rumors the band was reforming, but Randy was disappointed when he was turned down flat by Don and Glenn, and Timothy Schmidt was on the Hell Freezes Over tour. He also asked the band if he could just sit in with them at their Millennium Concert at the Staples Center in Los Angeles on New Year's Eve, 1999, but was turned down again. However, he says he holds no resentment toward Don and Glenn. The Eagles' 1998 appearance at the New York City Introduction Ceremony for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame featured all seven past and present members of the Eagles. His successor, Timothy B. Schmidt, 
paid a heartfelt tribute to Randy in his acceptance speech. Take a listen. I'd like to thank uh, who's ever responsible for my induction into this Hall of Fame. And on a brief personal note, um, I'd like to say that I was not in the trenches with this particular band. And so I'd like to thank my predecessor, Randy Meisner, for being there. Yeah. And paving the way for my being here tonight with him beside me and the rest of these guys. I'm very honored. Thank you very much. Following a minor heart attack in 2004, he was forced to cut back on playing out. As his health continued to deteriorate, he eventually stopped performing. His last known public performance was in 2008 in Naples, Florida. In March 2013, Randy suffered yet another health scare after losing consciousness in his California home. A piece of food obstructed his breathing while he was eating and he was rushed to the hospital. While doctors were optimistic about his recovery, Randy spent some time in a coma and in his weakened state was unable to participate in the History of the Eagles tour alongside fellow ex-bandmate Bernie Ledden. He later revealed that his former Eagle bandmates had paid the medical bills from his hospitalization. On March 6, 2016, police responded to a 9-11 call made by a woman from the couple's Studio City, California home asking for police assistance for a possibly intoxicated male suspect. 90 minutes later, after police had left the scene, Lana Meisner accidentally shot and killed herself when the rifle she was moving was struck by an object in his case and fired. Authorities determined that Meisner had no role in the shooting as surveillance tapes shows that he was in another part of the house at that time. Following the accidental shooting, Randy was placed under psychiatric hold after threatening suicide due to previous threats and mental issues. Randy seems to be doing better these days from what the news out there is. The last Randy sightings I found were a special guest appearance at two Richie Fure live stream concerts on August 27, 2020. Randy appeared via video from his home singing backup harmony with Fure and his band on the Buffalo Springfield song, For What It's Worth. And then on October 30th, 2020, Randy made a second remote appearance, singing background vocals with Richie's band on the Poco song, Picking Up the Pieces. He was also a special guest on the November 28, 2020, Joe Walsh's Old Fashioned Rock and Roll Radio Show, chatting with his friend and former Eagles bandmate on the independent 88.5 FM. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you see fit, please like and subscribe, as I would appreciate it. Don't forget to ring that notification bell, too. Thank you all for watching.